king and, and the succession of the thrones. Um, and it seems monotonous, and it, it, it's getting that way, but each one has their own story. Um, so each week we're, we're seeing the rise and fall. We see good kings. We see bad kings. We see all of these crazy things that cycle through, and it's amazing how fast these changes happen in these stories um, and the succession of the thrones. And remember a few weeks ago, some people were only in office three weeks, you know, some three days before they were assassinated and the next king took over and it was just amazing um, to see the fast pace. Um, <clears throat> but this week's chapter is not going to be any different. Uh, we're going to see you know, we see the rise and fall of these kings. We see good kings, bad kings, and unfortunately this week we're going to see another bad one. And he's right up there with the top of the list as far as badness goes. Um, I believe in the ancient dictionary during his day you could look up bad king and his name would be the first thing on the line. Um, so we're going to learn about Manasseh um, <clears throat> this week. Uh, Manasseh, it tells us in verse 1, was 12 years old when he became king. First off, I can't imagine being 12 and being given any responsibility, especially being a king, other than cleaning my room um, or cutting the grass. But here, this 12-year-old becomes king, um, and it tells us that he reigned. Actually, he had a very long reign. He reigned in Jerusalem 55 years, and he reigned until his death at the age of 67. Uh, so he had an extremely long reign. Um, it tells us his mother's name was Hephzibah. Um, it tells us immediately in verse 2 that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Following the detestable practices of the nations, the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all of the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem, I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. I would think that would be the understatement um, of the day. But look at what he did. Um, he completely reversed what his father had done. His father had kind of made some course corrections during his reign and, and began to realize that we need to be turning back to God. And he started to dismantle and take away some of these idols and um, horrible practices that were being done in the nation and started to get the nation back on the right track. And here his son just immediately reverses all of that. Um, and he starts rebuilding all of the high places. He starts re reintegrating the idol worship into the nation. Um, and the people are following right along with him. Um, but look at what it tells us happened in verse 6. I mean, everything that he was involved in was everything that the Lord had told them when they came out of the land of Egypt not to do. Um, through Moses, he had instructed the people of Israel not to do these things. And he gave them explicit examples because God knew what the neighboring nations were doing. And he didn't want Israel to be affected by what they were doing. And the whole plan was to drive those nations out and as they would enter the promised land so that they wouldn't be affected by these things, by association. Um, and as the old uh, saying goes, if you want to soar with eagles, you've got to quit hanging around with turkeys. And the Israelites were hanging around with turkeys. And they weren't soaring with eagles. Um, and they, so they were taking on their practices. 
the, by, just by association um, because they weren't following through with what God had instructed them to do. If we look back at what Moses instructed them to do um, through God's word, in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18, um, actually chapter, let me see, let me back up. Deuteronomy, here we go. Chapter 18, verses 9 through 13, speaking specifically about occult practices that the Lord wanted them to avoid. He says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. He says, let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. This is exactly what Manasseh was doing. He did exactly the opposite of what God wanted <laughs> the nation Israel to do. And as king, who did he represent? The people. He also represented God. And if the leadership isn't following the rules, why should we? You know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so he should have led by example. And instead, he followed these evil practices and then everyone else followed right along with him. Um, they were following the leader. Um, Leviticus tells us in two different places almost exactly the same thing. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, it says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And then in chapter 20, verse 6, he says, I will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them, and I will cut them off from their people. So what do you think God's going to do to Manasseh and to the people because of what they're doing? He tells us right there what he's going to do. He's going to set his face against them. He's going to oppose them because of what they're doing. Um, and let's look at verse 6 again and just now that we know what God commanded through Moses, look at what Manasseh it tells us he was doing again. He says he sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, he sought omens, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So God already told us back in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that Anyone who did these things, he would set his face against them. And so the people of the land followed right along with their leader and did these practices. Verse 7, you think it can't get much worse, but verse 7, it says, He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple. Now, of, out of any place that's supposed to be holy, you think the temple would be holy, right? And what does this guy do? He puts an idol or a symbol of an idol right in the temple. It would be like someone putting it right here, taking this cross down, taking this altar table down, and putting an idol in its place. That's what he did. And he put this pole up in the temple. He says, in the very place of which the Lord had said to David and his son Solomon, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. His name was supposed to be here. His representation. It's supposed to be him and only him and nothing else. And here this man is putting an idol in its place. He says, I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people 
did not listen. Manasseh led them astray, so they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. So the nations that were originally practicing these things, that God did not want them imitating or associating with, it tells us that because of Manasseh and the people following him, they did more evil than all of those nations combined. And they're supposed to be God's people. They're supposed to be the people who are set apart. They're supposed to be God's representative on earth, if you will, and be a shining example to the rest of the world. And it tells us that they did more evil than all of those other nations combined. Um, hard to imagine. It says, the Lord said through his servants the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And so when this disaster comes and the news of it spreads, when people get ear of it, it says when they hear of it, their ears are going to tingle because it's going to be such devastating news. And imagine getting devastating news, you know, and you get that phone call that you don't want to get or you hear of something on the news, some tragic event, and it shakes you to the core. He said, that's what's going to happen. He said, I'm going to do something to Jerusalem. And when it happens, it's going to make people's ears tingle because it's going to be so bad. He says, I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes out a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And so if you imagine you're washing dishes and you're cleaning out that dish after dinner, and what do you do when you wash it, right? You wipe it out, you turn it upside down, rinse it, make sure there's nothing left in it. He <laughs> put it in the dishwasher, Tim said. Um, but he said, that's what I'm going to do to Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to wipe it out as you would clean out a dish that you've just eaten out of, and I'm going to make sure that there's nothing left in it. And that should make you see what is coming um, and what he's going to do. He says, I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of the enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all their enemies. They have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. Now, was it literal pools of blood filled from end to end? Probably not visible to the human eye, but in God's eye, it was. This man caused so much death during his reign, and it says he shed innocent blood, that it filled Jerusalem from end to end. Can you imagine seeing that? Can you imagine God seeing that? And what he thought of it, it says, besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit, so they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So it wasn't just him, it was everybody. It was the nation. He says, as for the other events of Manasseh's reign and all he did, including the sin he committed, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Manasseh rested with his ancestors and was buried in his palace garden, the Garden of Uzzah. <clears throat> and Amon, his son, succeeded him as king. So look at what this man did in 55 years as king. Horrible, horrible things. And look at how he affected everybody underneath him. Um, and everybody followed along with him. Now, I'm sure not everybody, because it does say he shed innocent blood. Um, 
and we, it didn't go into detail about the innocent blood he shed. Um, but I can only imagine if this man was practicing this much evil, how much did he regard innocent life? Um, probably not very high at all. Um, so here we transition right in the middle of this chapter. We see a transition happening in authority. Um, Manasseh has now died. <clears throat> it tells us that his son now succeeds him as king. His son was a little bit older than he was when he took the throne. Ammon, it tells us, was 22 years old when he ascended to the throne. It says he only reigned in Jerusalem for two years. He only had a two-year reign. His mother's name was Meshulameth, daughter of Haruz. She was from Jotba. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Surprise, surprise. As his father Manasseh had done. He followed completely the ways of his father, worshiping the idols his father had worshipped and bowing down to them. He forsook the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and did not walk in obedience to him. Ammon's officials conspired against him and assassinated the king in his palace. Maybe some of the people finally had enough of, if you could imagine, a reign of terror in these last two generations. First Manasseh through Manasseh. Now they see his son is following in his father's footsteps. Maybe there was somebody in the officials or in that group or inner circle of people that said, we gotta do something. We gotta put a stop to this. Now was it the right thing to do? No, because God tells us we shouldn't kill. But they sought, sought out an opportunity and they took this man out. Um, it says, then the people of the land killed all of the people who had plotted against him. So the inner circle who had had him assassinated, they found out they killed them. Um, so with this vicious circle here, uh, it says, they killed those who plotted against King Ammon, and they made Josiah, his son, king in his place. So very quick secession here. Two years went by, and his reign is done. Now his son Josiah has been made king. Um, as for the other events of Ammon's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? He was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah, and Josiah, his son, succeeded him as king. And not to go too far into next week's chapter, but Josiah, it tells us, was eight years old. When he became king, can you imagine? Eight years old, we thought 12 was bad. Now an eight-year-old is going to ascend to the throne and have all of this authority um, and things at his command. But the interesting thing, I won't go too deep into next week's chapter, but this man actually started to serve the Lord. He actually started to do things right and started to right that ship if you will, and turn them back to God. Um, and they actually, during these reigns of these evil men, <clears throat> they had stopped practicing and worshiping God on a normal basis. They had gotten so far out of it that no one even knew how to do it regularly anymore. And it tells us that they actually find during Josiah's reign, they find the book of the law of Moses. And it had been lost. It had just been stuck away somewhere and buried. And it had been so long gone that no one even knew what it said anymore. And they discover it and they get it out. It would be like the Bible being lost. And someone discovering the Bible after a hundred years of non-existence. And then someone finding it and reading it. And Josiah actually has it presented. He calls everyone together and actually has someone read it to the people. <clears throat> and in so doing, it convicts the people. And they realize what they've been doing wrong. Because during all this time, they had no, they had nothing to tell them what they were doing was wrong. They had fallen so far from where they should have been, and they had no regular practice or in regular reading of the word, regular 
attendance of worship services. And, you know, a lot has been said, especially today, about people saying they don't need to attend church. We don't need it. We don't need to go to church to worship God. But I feel like you miss out on so much because you miss out on, if you're not in your word daily, at least on Sunday when you're here, you're at least getting some portion of it and you're getting it read to you, you're studying it, you're reading it yourself, you're being exposed to it like the people during Josiah's reign were for the first time in a hundred years. And they were actually getting witnessed to by the word, by the reading of the word. And for those people who say they don't need to be in church, I disagree because I need it. And people on the outside who look at it and think, you know, they're just a bunch of goody two-shoes. No, we're not. We're just as bad as everybody else. All of us in this room are just as bad as the people outside and everywhere else. But the difference is we know it because we've been reading this and we know how bad we are because we have an example to look to. And we know that we can't match what's in here. We can't be as good as God. That was the whole purpose of the Ten Commandments. It was to act as a mirror. And when we look in that mirror, we realize there's no way that we can do all ten of those things perfectly. And the only way we can become perfect is through Jesus Christ. And he makes us perfect through his sacrifice on the cross um, and taking our place. Um, so none of us can reach that level of perfection. We can't. It's impossible for us. But the only way through that is through Jesus Christ. Um, so, you know, I've already spoiled a little bit of next week's chapter, but Tim will continue that saga next week. Um, but it does have, the next two chapters do have a sort of a bright spot in them. We've seen so much bad in the last few chapters that it's time for a bright spot. And they almost have a revival, if you will. It's a renewing of the spirit. They, they're exposed to God's word and life starts to happen again. And good things start to happen for the people of Israel. And while it is brief, it does happen. Because we know we're leading into the um, expulsion into Babylon um, at the end of this book. But, you know, there is this bright spot coming for this couple of generations where they actually return back to God and start to follow him again. And actually read his word and are exposed to it. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the supernatural ability that you've endowed into this word and that you saw fit to have handed down from generation to generation and recorded all of this information through your prophets, Lord, through the people who have long since gone, but you saw fit to give them the ability to record all this information for us and to write it down so that we can read it, so that we can be exposed to it, so our children can be exposed to it. Lord, help us to study your word, to look into the secrets that you've given us in this book. And Lord, help us not to make it a secret. Help us to spread the good news to everyone we meet. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. You're welcome.